Hey everyone, welcome back to the homestead of Flat Rock. Uh, it's been a while since my last video, but I figure today is a decent time to take you guys around for a walk around. So, um, lots happened in the last few years, and, and the, I mean, the property is, after exploding with life, which is great, um, it's early in the morning now, so there shouldn't be any real big noise, noisy interruptions, so I figure it'd be a great time. Uh, this is our greenhouse growing year round and our check log terrace that we put in using materials that are just right off the property and uh, it's exploding exploding with life a lot of things at this point are starting to senesce things like lupins for example uh, black currants are still coming in lots of berries on all of these things this year uh, a lot of wildflowers have this stuff I don't even know what it is um, and I just kind of leave it walking onions and sorrel and a lot of it just sell seeds I don't bother with anything lots of comfrey on the go some of these are just used as nursery plants um, it's kind of down in this area it's fairly secluded so in the spring I come down I dig up some roots get some roots and then plant them all over the garden uh, we've got lots of foxgloves come in nature kind of just took care of that and then up here we're moving into kind of some crop stuff peas and rutabagas and carrots everything here here's under row cover we got huge problems with things like root maggot and and carrot rust fly is a big one the greenhouse i'm not going to bring you into because it's really noisy it's hard to even speak in there this year i put in a step with a little handrail and a removable fence for the chicken area um, so these guys now have access to a fairly large outdoor run I also use this area for making compost piles um, that are separate from the composter um, so this is kind of my chicken compost area now and this year I put in um, this kind of you know it's a removable fence um, in a few years time it's probably just going to come out of it once the wind break out in front of it actually gets more mature so there's a bit of autumn olive out there and and some um, spruce trees and just things that have blown in on the wind uh, dogberry and variety of stuff but having the composting area open allows the chickens to avail of the first bin which contains just basically the stuff that comes out of the kitchen so it's kind of great they get in they kind of just eat what they want and then they come out um, another big thing this year was water uh, rain water capture which comes off the roof and down into a tank and then it goes through this line and it feeds basically a perennial area down below those check log terraces and um, drip is hooked up to our growing beds um, which are down below so we have like Three beds are about 24 by 3, something like that. And uh, that totes about uh, somewhere around 250 or 300 gallons. So these guilds here are coming in nicely. Um, this is a cherry elderberry guild. So there's a couple of elderberries which are ranch. And uh, of course rhubarb. Rhubarb grows really well here. You can't get enough rhubarb here, honestly. It's just so easy to grow. I have red vein sorrels, and um, that's a Lappin's cherry up here. Um, it didn't have any cherries this year, but I've pruned it pretty hard in order to get a nice open form on, on it. Um, and then, you know, lots of walking onions and things. And ideally, I mean, my aim here is to cover the ground, um, you know, to make sure that, you know, that we've maximized I guess photosynthesis we're trying to build soil and trying to build habitat for insects and you know and critters and it seems to be working this area is uh, hazelnuts and apple trees autumn olives and it's all filling in nicely lots of comfrey this year in here um, I started in another area and every year I kind of kind of start moving it around um, by root cuttings and uh, they're great for for biomass um, so to put it in perspective for you like this one plant 
under this apple tree right here. Uh, this came from a piece of root about two inches long. So it's super easy. Now, the comfrey this time of year, we're chopping and dropping it. We do a lot of chop and drop. So the plants do look majestic uh, when they're kind of at full height in their reproductive stage, although they're sterile. But we, we hack them down and just drop them around fruit trees. So, so a lot of comfrey in here, for example, has been chopped and dropped. It was probably three and a half, four feet high at one point. And this is a comfrey here that was just chopped and dropped yesterday. But we don't chop it all the way back. I mean, we let it do its thing still. And it will start sprouting new stuff. Uh, this is a plum guild. We have some loose strife, um, which has grown quite nicely. And uh, native stuff. So this is all goldenrod and lovage, some hostas. This is a bit of a shady area sometimes of the day, so we push the hostas back fairly far under that shade, rhubarb and black currants back in behind. And you know, using these edges was a great idea. Originally when I was trying to design food forests, we were trying to figure out the best place to put it and obviously south facing um, edges seem to make the most sense. So we're going to do kind of the this food forest edge and we're going to come back around and look at the state of the annual garden um, I may I may maybe I shouldn't have put in all this mint actually I didn't I put in one plant but it's gone everywhere it's actually spearmint and uh, we have a bit of a market for it some some places actually want it for various things and um, so we, we sell most of that uh, sage keeps coming back year after year that that one's a hardy perennial some sages i don't think are in our zone but this one oregano and the asparagus has all gone to frond now it's kind of a thing of beauty and here we've interplanted that with strawberries which are just coming in this year so maybe they'll produce next year we'll see as long as they get established tarragon lots of rhubarb um comfrey that forgot to get chop and drop has gaps and back right against kind of that tree line we got Jerusalem artichokes. I dig these up every year. <laughs> they just keep producing. And I know it's a joke that, you know, once you got them, you never get rid of them, but I don't want to get rid of them. And then back along the back, we got some hops climbing up the trees, kind of using that, that's that, you know, the seven kind of, you know, um, areas in a food forest model where you're using some vining plants to get, you know, some height and to produce some yield. And the yields don't always need to be about us. You know everything here yields I and mean, it's just lush and beautiful and um, for me the, the yields can just be for nature and and some of them are like our mushrooms we didn't get many this year nature took most of them uh, the slugs they a really wet spring and they uh, they tend to to like those mushrooms for some reason but luckily because they like the mushrooms it seems that they don't touch anything else so it's almost a trap crop we get some, they get the most uh, this year, at least last year I picked over 50 or 60 pounds, maybe even up to 100. It was, it, I gave up counting, it was so much. And uh, Plum Guild's doing good, this Sea Buckthorn Guild seems to be doing good. And then up here is kind of the apple orchard. We got some um, stuff on, on uh, Bud Nines, which is against that trellis there. And then there's another apple tree over there, it's a dwarf. And that guy's uh, up here is uh, Empire, it's kind of a dwarf. And, and this one here I get to around 8 feet, 9 feet. But as this is a honey crisp, and it seems to be doing really well despite rabbit damage in the spring and, and winter. The snow almost covered that. We'll start cutting this canopy upwards so this can get more light. And then along here we got some, uh, some uh, uh, sea berry or sea buckthorn. Has gaps, currents. Uh, the currents this year are absolutely gone crazy. It's a lot. That's just one branch gone mad. So, um, in the comfrey, you can see it's chopped and dropped. This was all kind of that high, like three and a half, four feet, and it had to go. And I chop and drop it, like I said, and I just drop it around the trees. And uh, none of it, none of this has any 
fertility other than the wood chips breaking down, which the mushrooms do a great job at, at doing. If you did, there was at least a foot or more of wood chips on some of this. If you dig down now, it's all just soil. Uh, so if you really want to do sheet mulching and to get soil out of it quickly, something that breaks down that woody matter matters. Um, mushrooms. And there's a bunch of different types, but wine caps are super easy. Um, so up here used to be a lawn. And I know people often have these um, nostalgic visions of children frolicking and stuff in lawns but it, it doesn't really happen that much um, it can be turned into a much more productive space um, because oftentimes kids just aren't really enticed to go out in backyards anymore um, and some of it may be related to not having the right stuff there and uh, you'd be surprised nature nature speaks wonders to children um, Along here we got uh, basically zucchinis, um, acorns, and, and butternuts. And here we got a maximum land race uh, experiment. There's seven varieties here that are all fairly closely planted together. They're about four feet apart, planted in hills of two, and all sheet mulched using that kind of roost out hay method. So every year I'll just come in and mulch it with hay and plant squash. And the idea here is that we've got a bunch of varieties that are um, long season. We got some are short, short, still long for here. Um, some have good storage qualities, some don't. We'll kind of let them swarm. We'll let them do their thing, cross pollinate. Um, and some of them are actually not F1. Some of them are heirloom. So. The idea is is that we'll we'll introduce some new genetics and every year hopefully get a whole bunch of F1s uh, which will all exhibit um, I think it's termed hetero heterozygous vigor. So they'll they'll all basically be vigorous growers because you've introduced new genes. Uh, this is new this year. This is a wind mitigation strategy um, for this area down down here. As most of our winds are from up here in the west they come down across so we got a plum uh, which I've actually grafted a second plum as a pollinator too because the other one's too far away and that graft came in nicely uh, sea buckthorn male sea buckthorn female and a mulberry which actually it, it's I mean it's living yeah I wouldn't say that it's thriving um, but it is living in our zone here five 5a 5b 5b um, so we'll see maybe it'll come in um, I'm not gonna hold it I let nature do what it wants to do if it lives it lives if it dies it dies um, this fence is temporary uh, it was just put here as a wind mitigation strategy for behind which is where basically we have a kitchen sink well it's kind of just a stainless steel outdoor sink um, that allows us to wash vegetables and that kind of stuff. Uh, we don't have to bring everything inside with dirt and stuff on it. And the big push this year was for uh, rainwater collection through the downspout. Uh, comes through a diverter, fills from the bottom up, and the tanks are vented. And the whole thing then is hooked into drip irrigation lines, which are just dug under the sod, just open it up with a sod cutter and uh, you see every one of these lines have its own shut off um, and then there, there are certain things so down there for example um, that's all kind of on one subset of lines I can shut them all off at once or I can shut them individually depending on what I want to irrigate um, but the drip lines just run at surface level super cost effective I think to for like 2,000 feet of line and all the fittings that was probably 400 bucks I mean we we make enough money from some of the things that we sell on the property to take care of, of those upgrades so i don't really worry a whole lot about it um it seems to be you know a good year we had a really wet spring uh so you know our our soil which is heavily loaded in carbon now with all the organic matter that we add it seems to retain water well but we still need to irrigate but it's amazing how little you need to irrigate um in order to maintain moisture levels 
Um, a garden of this size require about 620 gallons a week if you're surface watering, but um, I've watered as little as maybe a half of that or even a quarter and it seems to be doing fine. Um, lots of things are coming in early this year. Our potatoes seem to be flowered and now the flowers are gone, which is really early for this time of year. Uh, fava beans already have huge pods on them. We're only at the second week of July. Usually that happens in the fourth week of July. June was four degrees warmer. Uh, this perennial area really filled in nicely. This is all just um, kind of herbs and um, you know, some beneficial plants in here like comfrey which is chopped and dropped. And we got some uh, blackberries in the back. Lovage which is quite majestic. Every year it gets that high. And th these plants are quite nice too, um, bloody dock. Uh, and they're quite ornamental, but they provide some nice colored salads and stuff in the spring. So a lot of perennial stuff on the go. Garlic, of course, we grow garlic under many different contexts um, and for different reasons. But I won't get into that in this video. Um, yeah, so this is just our annual garlic crop. All hardneck music, uh, Newfoundland heritage, and uh, there's a Rokum bowl there. I can't remember what that one is called. And then uh, it's been a bad year trying to germinate carrots. So wet, so many slugs. Um, but the brassicas are all doing well. We have a huge issue here with uh, club root. So the the club root resistant varieties that I use, I find that they, they don't really have the vigor of the non club root resistant varieties. And I don't know if it's something just with their genetic makeup, but uh, we do get yields out of them, but I feel like they're not as good as if they weren't club root resistant in non-club root soil. So um, whatever the case, it is what it is. Um, so besides that, potatoes are a huge crop besides squash. Squash is kind of, you know, I, I aim to get as many as I can because I love them. Um, but beside that we store a lot of potatoes anywhere from three to five hundred pounds depending on the year and what beds are being used and everything's in a rotation so we go um kind of alliums this is all shallots this year uh, solanum solanum legumes brassicas and then where the fennel is here roots so roots is anything that doesn't fall into those other four families and it works quite well for pests um and disease. I, last year I had non-scabby potatoes. Some of it was variety driven, um, but some of it was different, definitely related to the fact that, you know, we, um, we rotate the crops. Our peas are coming in. We've been picking peas now for about two weeks. This is the first run, first of July, which really, really early for, for this year. Um, some interesting things on the go here in this perennial bed, which I'm filling in slowly with various things. I'm observing and interacting. Uh, so I observe and then wait and see what happens and then I interact make a change and kind of permaculture based slow especially like, like slow cooking you know like slow food uh, you just kind of wait around and see what happens um, Loch Ness blackberry this year due to good pruning it's uh, putting on hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of berries um, Chester is a um, thornless black all kind of trellised against this it's just a bunch of sticks i pulled from their property down here we had a tour recently and a lot of people kind of liked all these little ideas uh, but we got the resources because the property is big enough i just cut cut down what i want um skirt skirt's a kind of a medieval vegetable puts on a lot of roots so there's a lot of survival food stuff here you know stuff you wouldn't necessarily eat all the time but if you run out of certain things you could or if supply chains break down you'd have food sources um, blackberries here against this trellis I put in last year I had all the materials for it but it took me three years to get around to doing this project um, I just recycled a bunch of old um, wooden beds that I took out from up above and uh, just put those in around the contained soil until everything kind of grows roots and eventually when it rots I'll just pull it out of it uh, maybe I'll edge it with some rocks or something uh, but it's just these kind of steel posts these aren't driven down with those those things you see people online with 
Um, they're, they're, you had to dig a hole three feet deep and pour it into concrete um, because here there's just so much rock. But this is coming in nicely. Lots of nice new three foot growth uh, since last month on, on these Chester blackberries. Uh, some of them are even putting on flowers from last year's growth, which is great. Um, same thing here. Uh, grape vines are coming in nice. This one is valiant and um, I've trained it to force a cordon along here and along along here and along the top and every now and then I just tie it down and I'll, I'll spur prune these so if you don't know what spur pruning is just look it up different grapes kind of prune want to be pruned differently nice canes coming on these blackberries here all against this kind of south facing facade so it gets some good shade in the early morning um, when there's a good bit of light but in the afternoon it's getting it's getting full on sun I tell you it's a great place for these grapes they're at they're thriving look at look at the leaves on these the leaves are almost almost as big as my hand you wouldn't believe you could grow that here but yeah, totally at one point I think there might even be some flowers on one of these uh, yeah there's some little grape flowers uh, in, right oh it's hard to see I can't get it maybe it's right here yeah anyway so that's uh, pretty much the walk around lots of big changes this year and irrigation lines and things pretty crazy really uh, this is a Bob Gordon elderberry guild that I put in last year there's St. John's Ward and salad burn it there there's some uh, lupins on the outside still got to get some comfrey into this bed uh, a few things I put here just died. I don't know why. But I, this is terraced into, into the hillside. So there's this rock thing here with a swale behind it. It's very short, small swale. But I never wa have to water this. Um, yeah, you know, it's this check log terrace along the front. So it's about slowing and spreading water. Right, slow and spread, slow and spread. So yeah, yeah, it's pretty, uh, yeah, it's pretty, pretty good, this method of check log terrace and things this area here same same deal we got a couple of uh, we got a goomy berry here which is putting on a lot of berries this year which i'm really looking forward to and for cooking and various things i know they can be tart and astringent and stuff but um and then back in amongst all this what most people will call a mess um there's a lot of support plants here and there's uh couple of um, uh, happy Saskatoon berries in amongst it there's um, you know st. John's wort lupins comfrey um, there's a sour cherry back here that's doing really really nicely uh, it's really starting to get trained to an open form next year we should get uh, some good cherries on it and then we have other things in the garden like this lupin it's it's dying the ground is actually moist um, I know that it's gone through its reproductive stage, but it seems to be dying from the ground up. So it may be fusarium or, or something, whatever affects this plant. But the other ones around it seem healthy, so na nature has spoken. Kind of just leave it, let it alone. Let nature do its thing. I'm not going to fight against that. And um, our wood pile acts as a bit of a wind shelter for, for some of this area over here. And perennial leeks, we've been perennializing leeks over the last few years. Um, and this is all, this is all leeks that have been left. Um, and if you notice, there are some little ones coming up around. So a lot of leeks actually shoot these corms. And it's like a little, little bulb at the base that forms a whole new leek. But they put on majestic flowers too. So down here, this is a corm. That formed from a corm, that formed from a corm, and a whole load of new corms coming up here. So this year, these that have the flower, they'll die back to this to the ground, but these are left. And they're clones of the original plant. Um, likewise down here, yeah. So every year they come back, which is not what people realize. Um, they're biennial, and they are biennial here in zone, uh, 5b which is pretty cool lots of flowers on our autumn olives this year we're going to use them for cooking mainly uh, 
kind of as a replacement for barberries, which I, have, I don't really have access to here, and I've heard are an invasive species, so you know, I won't bother with with it. In this area, we got kind of our sea buckthorn area and a chestnut, and uh, over here a golden black elderberry. So it's black, but it's really gold colored leaves. Um, that's a titan um, sea buckthorn. Lord male and this uh, orange energy over there and uh, they're, they're putting on some berries this year which is nice we'll see some berries lots of rhubarb things to kind of help shield the ground and maintain moisture levels uh, comfrey I even got some potatoes in here and there's a lot of stuff goat weed wow the goat weed uh, but you know what you can't get rid of that there's no way to get rid of all that and it's everywhere so um, I chop it and drop it around black currants and stuff because it seems to be a never-ending supply of it and uh, sometimes the younger shoots we eat it in chimichurri and that works quite well so from the front of the house now all this area which was just an edge of lawn that I used to mow all the time is filled in with a lot of native species uh, colt's foot and creeping buttercup and I means everything but it's alive uh, yarrow down here and dock things that move into marginal land has really taken over um, but still still beautiful gumi berries and it's a cherry and a shrub shrub cherry lots of support plants around it um, we got marsh woundwort most people Hedge nettle, I think, is the other name. Most people would be horrified when they see it. It starts popping up everywhere, but it got these beautiful little pink flowers on them. And the roots actually are almost long and tubular, and they can be eaten. And they actually smell quite nice when you break them. Uh, so survival food, too. Uh, Jerusalem artichokes and, you know, docks. Um, this one is red vein sorrel. Um, this year we grew my King Henry, which I haven't eaten yet. I'm waiting for the plants to get the size, but there it is. And apparently it's like spinach, but I'm just kind of waiting for it to get the size so I can start propagating it in another place. It uh, seems to not care a whole lot about the heat. Uh, you know, it seems to just make it through. And of course, well, we have, you know, experiments in perennializing garlic. Um, every year we kind of just let garlic do its thing um, this year were bulbs that were planted last year so I, they're just first years but uh, some of them have been left and they have like three and four scapes coming up uh, i think this year i decided to pull all the scapes i think it's throughout the food force we pulled maybe i was 100 scapes just off per perennialized garlic that's not including my annual crop so yields yields don't always have to be roots they can sometimes be shoots things that you just harvest part of the plant and leave the rest of the plant and nature will you know do its thing with it so that's it wow wow that was 28 minutes i didn't think it was going to be that long but there's a lot going on you know um so there you have it um you know if you guys have any comments uh feel free to leave them below you know, if you have comments about the water system or, you know, our food force system, our chicken compost system, God, there's a lot, man, there's a lot of systems. I, it's a little overwhelming, you know, like um, if you really stop and you, you sit down and you, you, you think about where you've come, um, yeah, you know, you know, it's fairly short period of time that comes to think of it I mean 10 years is kind of long but it's been about six years and uh, it's pretty amazing really oh the other thing that we have is try to try to go net zero on the house so up above uh, we're going to try to get a good shot and this will be the final shot I promise uh, but it'll be a great one it's a great shot from the food force looking back on to the home and me saying goodbye 
uh, up at the other end of the garden across the, squ the squash patch. We'll take a look at the house and the energy system or PV system we installed it's not off-grid we uh, just feed energy back to uh, the grid which in our context works fine uh, but there it is hard to see right now wow that's bright Let's see if i can get out of the sun so you guys can see that a little bit better let's see here uh man that's really bright up there really hard to see but anyway there are, there are solar panels on the roof um, and they feed energy back to the grid and for the most part by the look of it by the time September comes which should be at zero and there it is uh, the homestead at Flat Rock that's a labor of love never want to be anywhere else Anyway, guys, thanks for joining me. Um, hope you enjoyed the tour. Like I said, if you got comments about anything, leave them below. Like and subscribe to, you know, to the channel. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. Uh, you know, I don't get often, often I don't get time to, to do videos, but um, this one's unedited. I don't have time to edit it, honestly. There's, there's too much on the go. All enjoyable, of course. See you later.